This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat, a new show that takes a deeper look at the stories, trends, and influencers shaping New Jersey's business landscape each week. We begin this week with a lot of confusion around talks on a stimulus package to boost the economy. Midweek, President Trump called off negotiations with Democrats after both sides failed to reach an agreement. But even after that, both sides were still talking. It's hard to say what happens next politically, but in terms of what happens next to the economy, it is not a pretty picture, according to a Rutgers University professor that I spoke with. Michael Hayes, Associate Professor of Public Policy and Administration at Rutgers Camden. It's great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. So, stimulus. I honestly don't even know where to begin based on the headlines we saw out of Washington this week. Obviously, the situation can change from what we know now. It doesn't look like a second stimulus bill is in the immediate future. Potentially, how detrimental is it to the economy if there is no other stimulus bill? No, this is concerning. From an economics perspective, uh, we can look at the latest jobs report that was offered in September, and it looks like the job recovery is slowing. Um, and I would not be shocked as we travel into the holiday season and also with COVID continuing to spread, we might continue to see a slowing, if not a dip in our economic recovery. So how would federal money from Washington change that trajectory? Why is it needed to reverse that? We still have a demand issue. So uh, we still have households that are struggling to pay their bills. You still have households that have deferrals on their mortgage payments. Uh, you still have businesses struggling to continue to, to meet the, 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 their payrolls uh, by, because there's just less of demand. So when the government comes in and offers stimulus, by giving checks to individuals, to giving uh, uh, payroll uh, protection to businesses. That's one way of just pumping money into a system to keep demand, to keep economic activity, that keeps jobs. And then when jobs are there, that just continues to be a positive cycle for the economy to recover. So what do we know from our past economic slumps? And I'm thinking of the Great Recession here in terms of the need for government spending. So there's been a lot of studies that suggest that during recessions, every dollar that a government spends in terms of stimulus uh, uh, creates more than a dollar in economic output. So in other words, the way to think about it, uh, one estimate suggests that it's $1.50 of economic output for every dollar that's spent by the federal government. So here you have an opportunity to make sort of an investment, that is the federal government can make this investment, where you get a 50% return on that investment. And if you look at other recessions, like the Great Recession, uh, some economists have argued that there was not enough stimulus, and that basically prolonged the Great Recession and led us to, uh, it was a longer time to recover. And even the Fed Chairman, Jerome Powell, made a very strong case in the past week about the need for more stimulus. Yeah, I think um, the monetary policy has been phenomenal from a credit crisis standpoint. Uh, so the, the credit markets, the banks are liquid. Uh, that's great. But they lack the ability that fiscal policy, Congress passing bills like stimulus package, they don't have that power. So it's been uh, ever since the spring, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank has been very clear to both the president and Congress that they need to uh, continue the fiscal stimulus and fiscal policy to, to get, us, get us out of this recession. Again, Michael, this can all change, but based on kind of where we are at this point, what about the idea of passing a bill just to help airlines or just to help small businesses or just to get stimulus checks out? This is something that President Trump suggested. Is that better than nothing? Um, it's hard to tell. So I think obviously something's better than nothing, but the, there needs to be a sizable stimulus. I think every economist, including the Federal Reserve Bank chair, is suggesting that it needs we need to overspend than underspend. And if I think if we do just this in piecemeal, given that it's election year, I just don't see that there's going to be political pressure to do what is needed. So if we just do an airline bailout, for example, 
I don't think there's going to be then a push to have checks to individuals, like the stimulus checks that we saw back in the spring and summer. So I think it makes sense both politically and economically to try to put all of these things together that gives us the best chance to get a sizable stimulus bill that really will um, make a dent uh, in this recession. And we haven't talked about it yet, Michael, but how significant would it be for the government of New Jersey if we don't get more federal money? This is something that Governor Murphy has been talking about, uh, and, and obviously it was a big issue during our budget battle. What happens to this state, uh, the government businesses and individuals, if we don't get any more money from Washington? Yeah, I think a state like New Jersey, um, I think if you look at just state and local government uh, jobs, it's a sizable, non-trivial portion of, of our economy. And we know that across the country, all state and local governments have taken a hit because they have to have balanced budgets. So one way to deal with a shortfall in your revenue is to cut its spending. Well, cutting spending during recession is not good. So um, for the, for the, if you're looking at New Jersey, New, New Jersey would really benefit from having uh, the federal aid to state and local governments. But one could argue that all state governments, it's not just a New Jersey issue. This is, this is a uh, health and economic crisis that's affecting all states right now. Michael Hayes, it's been great speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Without more federal money, efforts on the state level to help businesses could stall. But the EDA was able to launch a new targeted assistance program this week. I spoke with the CEO of the EDA, Tim Sullivan. Tim Sullivan, CEO with New Jersey's Economic Development Authority. It's great to talk to you once more. Great to be with you, Rhonda. How are you doing? Doing pretty well. Um, you guys have been busy the last couple of months and just this week announced kind of the latest tool in the EDA arsenal to help businesses. And that is a consulting program targeted for businesses in New Jersey's Opportunity Zones. Tell us about the program and why you're taking this approach. Yeah, it's an exciting new program that really, really builds on the comprehensive approach that Governor Murphy has taken to supporting small businesses through this pandemic. Uh, we know this is a pandemic uh, that is as a public health matter and as an economic matter been borne disproportionately by communities of color uh, and small businesses of color. Uh, and so we've set up this program to help provide some, some training and technical resources for businesses located in opportunity zones to help them do a whole range of things, uh, act, you know, uh, access um, and apply for uh, grants and loans and other uh, emergency relief tools, as well as um, uh, get their, you know, uh, get their businesses ready for what's coming in terms of a, uh, whether it's a second wave or addressing, you know, adding e-commerce to their capabilities, uh, all kinds of things to help them uh, strengthen their, their business, particularly small businesses. And this is really targeted at what I would call micro businesses, right? Five employees or fewer. Yeah, five and under uh, with a physical, uh, with a sort of storefront or a physical location in New Jersey and uh, located in one of the 169 opportunity zones. And these are businesses that, you know, came into this uh, pandemic with the, you know, with the fewest resources uh, to deal with a, with, a, with, with a downturn like this. And um, that really, when you add them up, collectively employ you know, hundreds of thousands of, of New Jersey residents. Um, and so it's a really important part of our economy and one that doesn't get the attention it deserves. So I know one thought that the EDA has is potentially expanding this program if it proves to be successful. Yeah, uh, we've done this a few times. We did this sort of, you know, we do this a lot prior to the pandemic as well, you know, trying to, to pilot programs, see if they work, learn from what doesn't, uh, and if they do work and if there's interest, you know, scale them. Uh, this is an initial $100,000 uh, program we think we'll be able to serve, you know, probably 50 or 100 businesses through this, which is not nothing, but not, uh, you know, not, um, not at the scale of New Jersey's economy. And if it goes well and it, there's, um, uh, and if there's a significant impact from it and we can find some resources to fund it, uh, this is the kind of thing we look to scale and expand if it's, uh, if it's impactful. You uh, went where I wanted to go next and that is the situation with resources. I know when we've spoke before, the EDA has kind of exhausted uh, resources available. We know at least today, there's no federal money on the way based on what's happening in Washington with um, the lack of stimulus talks. I mean, how, how is the situation right now? Are there businesses that still need help, but the resources aren't there to help them? 
Yeah, I think Governor Murphy's been 100% correct in his frustration with the way Washington seems to be uh, handling this, uh, you know, the economic situation in, in through the summer and into the fall here. Um, certainly the needs in small business are extraordinary and, and they continue to, to um, they continue to pile up as as the as the as the, the economic slowdown continues, and that economic slowdown is is nationwide, and it's happening here in New Jersey as well because of uh, not just it's you know less to do with restrictions and more to do with consumer behavior. People are you know are staying home more. They're doing they're, they're even if things are open, they're going out um, you know less, and so that's hurting small business in a big way. Uh, and that's you know for a lot of people, that's the right public health decision, but it's not helping the economy. And so without some additional support from Washington, it's it's going to be even tougher. And at this point, um, there's limitations on the state side. We know we just went through the uh, budget situation in New Jersey. So is it really um, a need for the federal government to step up at this point, do you think? Yeah, I think the federal the federal funds uh, have been critical. Uh, you know, between PPP, the, the 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 small business program that was part of the CARES Act, and and the unemployment insurance that the federal government supplied, a little bit more than thirty billion dollars of um, of federal support came in between something like May and July. It's an extraordinary amount of money. New Jersey's budget on a 12 month basis is about $40 billion. Um, and so 30 billion is an extraordinary amount of money to support New Jersey's economy that, that can only come from Washington. Tim Sullivan, always a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks. Right, great, being, great being with you. This weekend, thousands of movie screens across the country went dark. Regal Cinemas is temporarily shutting more than 500 movie theaters across the U.S., including 11 in New Jersey. Its parent company has lost money due to the pandemic, and on top of that, big-budget movie releases have been delayed. More than 40,000 Regal employees are now facing furloughs, joining millions of others who remain out of work. One New Jersey Congresswoman has a plan to get people working again. In our deep dive this week, we're focusing on women and business. Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman has introduced a bill to make sure women and others have more job opportunities with higher pay. She wants to create a federal job guarantee program that ensures that any individual who applies gets a job. Jobs would pay at least $15 an hour and would target areas of need like childcare and infrastructure. And it's very close to the kind of thing that you saw in after uh, the Great Depression, where we put whole of government to work to get people to work. And this is a time right now with the COVID exasperating the already underemployment of women and minorities uh, to think boldly and to move forward and to guarantee work. One prominent New Jersey resident spends a lot of time thinking about the advancement of women in our state. First Lady Tammy Murphy told me about some of her concerns and where she sees opportunities for New Jersey's women. First Lady Tammy Murphy, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for having me, Rhonda. It's, it's an honor to be here and I congratulate you on this new platform. Thank you, thank you kindly for that. You have been so much focused on supporting women-owned business. Uh, this has been part of your platform as, as First Lady of New Jersey. How has the pandemic changed or shifted any of your efforts? Uh, wow. Well, it's it's certainly has changed um, our efforts in as much as uh, there's there's a lot of work to do. Um, I think you would you would agree with me that there were many inequities uh, across our state, across our country, if not around our world. And this pandemic has, um, if perhaps you can look at it as a shining uh, light on it, it's really opened up the Pandora's box. We now know that some of the inequities that were here before the pandemic are, are now here forever and it's gonna be hard to put them back in Pandora's box. So um, as a consequence, you know, I have uh, done all sorts of things, um, not necessarily differently since the pandemic. Um, I, I, I have been working on a fund that I started, but, but putting the fund aside, I would say it's just caused us all to work a lot more efficiently to try and and uh, and correct many of these inequities, whether they be in healthcare, in government, in business, you you name it. And those inequities, it seems, really are a challenge for women in particular. I just saw a statistic that showed 
in September, four times as many women dropped out of the labor force than men. This is a national statistic. Um, but very likely some of those issues that you just referred to are the reasons behind that. It's very discouraging when you see a statistic like that. Yeah, there, there's, there's no question. You know, um, women, women receive so little credit when it comes to, uh, I don't know, business, you pick it, business or, or government, pick, your, pick your, your flavor. But, you know, I think there was a study in, in 2015 of um, 300 companies by a venture firm that concluded that female founded companies performed 63% better than all male teams. And even though women owned businesses account for 40% of new com uh, companies, um, it's been estimated that less than 20% of startup capital goes to women led businesses. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a pretty damning statistic. Um, yeah, and, and you know, there's, there's stats that say that less than 10% of decision makers at venture capital firms are women and 74% of US venture capital firms have no female investors. Um, so, you know, that, that, that gives me a good segue to tell you about an initiative that we started in New Jersey back in February. We launched uh, a New Jersey chapter of something called Golden Seeds, which is a national angel investor network um, that invests, finds and pairs investors with female startup entrepreneurs and not only helps the females have the capital that they so desperately need, but also uh, provides the mentorship, which is the really um, the unique feature of Golden Seeds. But that is the first venture that, that Golden Seeds has ever done in the United States with a government, because this was set up by the, as a joint venture with the EDA and with our office. Um, so pretty exciting and, and, a, and a good way to try and help women across New Jersey. They've had tremendous success since February. That's great. I remember you and I talked about that back in February and March before the pandemic. So it's good to hear that that is progressing. I, I want to ask you as well about, you know, the other issue we have with women is leadership, lack of leadership roles for women. Uh, when your husband became our governor, he made a point of uh, putting women in the cabinet, more women than any other prior governor, why can we get that right in government but haven't yet in business? Well, I, first of all, um, it's absolutely true. Phil did that and he has the first female majority cabinet in the history of uh, New Jersey's legislature of cabinet. You know, but I will also tell you that we aren't necessarily, you know, as much as we are um, really on the, on the leading edge and we are, we are really um, championing uh, many things, whether it's, you know, paid leave, whether it's um, equity and um, pay, you know, there's so many ways that we are, we are really on, on the right, on the right trajectory. Um, I believe I'm right in telling you that we still only have 37 uh, female legislatures out of 120 in, in, in our, in our state. So we have a ways to go, let there be no doubt. Um, but you know, I think that um, the data for for companies is is very much you know it's similar to what you see in government. In government, we have tried to put lead, put women and um, people of color and make sure that we have the diversity at the table because it's it's far easier to govern and to um, employ you know to get people to come on board and agree and and be open and and work with the government when people who are in the community can see that people who are trying to help them look like them, act like them and understand them. And, and the same thing can be said in business. You know, I, I think that it's been proven that uh, when, when you have women in um, top management positions, not only has it been proven to increase profit margins and produce more patents um, than teams with solely male leaders, but more diverse teams are more productive. And uh, so I think that, that that says something not only at government, but at the business level. Do you see other sectors that perhaps women should consider that traditionally they might not have? Listen, um, I will tell you that technology is an important sector in New Jersey for many reasons. Phil has said that he wants to be the innovation state. And you know, the only way we are gonna get there is if we really embrace our diversity um, but technology as a, as a general matter, I know that, you know, Golden Seeds um, invests in basically three industry sectors, 
um, technology, healthcare, and consumer retail sector. Um, and so I, I think that there are so many areas where we can, you know, really, we can really encourage women to step up. Um, I had gone on a listening tour all around the state and met with uh, female entrepreneurs across so many different business sectors, um, pharmaceuticals, food, um, healthcare. I mean, there's, there's bookstores. We, 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 are, um, we, are, we are out there and it's just a matter of making sure that we have the same chances that the men have and others have who are um, coming ahead of us. First Lady Tammy Murphy, thanks so much, first of all, for all the efforts that you've done on behalf of our state. And thank you for speaking with me today. Okay, thanks, Rhonda. Thank you for having me. We tracked down one CEO who is making sure women get those chances. Aisha Taylor Issa is founder of Sistas in Business Expo, built as the country's only multi-city small business expo for entrepreneurial women of color. It's nice to chat with you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I appreciate you having me. So you run expos really across the country. You've got one in Newark uh, next spring. Fingers crossed, I guess that will uh, yes. go off regardless of <laughs> where we are with things. Um, right. How do you take the idea to kind of gather women together in various cities? So uh, this um, movement really started out of a need that I experienced myself as a, uh, a woman of color in business. I own and have owned a career consulting business with my sister for over 15 years. And we always wanted to participate in events like this because they are great for exposure and networking and scaling your audience, but always found that the costs were prohibitive. Um, and so we wanted to create a platform that um, still met those needs, but that came at a more affordable option. Uh, for your average micro to small business owner. And so um, around 2018, um, when we decided to officially launch this, is, there was a lot of talk about women of color being the largest and fastest growing demographic of entrepreneurs in the country. But when you dig a little deeper, you find that they're the least earning. And so in other words, we're starting a lot of businesses, but those businesses are not earning a lot of money. And so um, I knew that this was the right time to really launch this effort in order to help close that gap of earning potential. Why are so many women of color starting businesses now? You know, I think it's, it's multifaceted. Um, first of all, we're just an uh, amazingly talented group of people, right? So we have a lot of interests, a lot of skills um, that can be monetized, uh, whether we're baking cakes, making um, soaps, or uh, teaching financial literacy, right? Uh, and so we're, we're just an extremely talented group of people. But then also, uh, it just comes out of a history of entrepreneurship. Uh, people of color um, historically have had to find other means to uh, to find, um, you know, funding for it to keep their families afloat when businesses wouldn't hire them or wouldn't pay them equally. And so we're just a very um, industrial people who have always uh, found a way to, to make a way. And I think that entrepreneurship now with all of the resources that are available for us has, has grown as a result of that. Uh, and so I think that's, that's kind of some of the reasons why. So the earnings side of the equation, of course, is not um, what I'm sure you're satisfied with. Why are we seeing that situation? And how does your organization help to empower women to try to, um, you know, make that be a rear view mirror issue? Yeah, well, the, the main issue is that we are the least funded um, and least supported when it comes to investors and um, financial resources and opportunities. Uh, women of color are the, the least funded. Uh, and so we're trying to help close that gap by um, connecting our women with funding resources and with those who are interested in supporting the efforts of women of color in business. Uh, and then also it just becomes a matter of teaching um, the, the community the importance of supporting um, businesses that are owned by people of color. Uh, and so whereas normally I might run to a, a big box store to you know, get some soap or something like that, I can reach out to a small business and support them um, by purchasing the soap from there. So it, it's a matter of just kind of retraining the, the mind in terms of uh, where our dollars should go, that it's important that we invest back into our communities because that's how we really leave a legacy. What have we seen uh, throughout the pandemic? There have been some efforts to help small business. Uh, are those efforts enough? It's a start. It's definitely a start. I don't know that it's enough uh, just because the need is so great. There was already a need before the pandemic. 
uh, to support uh, small businesses and women of color in business in particular. And so the pandemic just um, heightened that uh, 10 times fold, right? And so um, there have been some, some great programs that have provided assistance, um, but I don't think anybody expected the pandemic and its effects to last this long, right? So when you give you know, a small business a, a grant or a loan of $1,000 or $3,000, yeah, that can keep you for maybe one or two months, but we're going into our eighth month of this pandemic and the impact that it's continuing to have. Uh, I remember early on in the pandemic, someone said that the financial impact would be far greater than the health impact. And I think that that's true because it's gonna take a long time for businesses, particularly small businesses to recover. Aisha, it's been so great uh, hearing what you're up to and helping us sort through perhaps the future for small businesses and women in New Jersey and elsewhere. Yes, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching NJ Business Speed. Make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. You'll get an alert when we post a new episode or clip. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. See you next week.